Um, okay, so um, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to this talk. My name is Paweł Kowalski and I'm a senior technical artist at the Project Red. Um, yeah, the title is long, but in short, I'll be talking about how we created a simplified representation of characters, like crews and uh, buildings and other objects for Night City for Cyberpunk 2077. We'll see why it was important, how we did it, and what uh, results we accomplished at the end. Okay, um, firstly, I'm obligated to inform you that this project was co-founded within sectoral program gaming provided by the National Center for Research and Development, and that's a measure 1.2 research, um, sectoral research and development program. Uh, let's start with a short presentation of Nice City, just to show what we'll be talking about. Okay, so I hope we can draw one conclusion from this uh, video. The night city is really big and complex. A uh, huge scale goes, to the, goes together with a great amount of details. Um, yeah, for example, in this shot, you can see a gigantic building that will be visible from many kilometers, but if you'd get close to it, you could see a lot of details, a lot of meshes attached to it. And um, this scale causes some problems. Um, also, the second reason why I wanted to show this video is because you could notice all of mechanisms that we'll be talking about uh, later in action it. <clears throat> okay, so like I said, the um, city is quite big and complex, and so I'm gonna start with naming two of uh, tools we use to create such complex environment. It, those will be prefabs and appearances. Prefabs could be regarded as a basic building block of Night City. Uh, they are nested uh, structures of meshes, um, uh, meshes entities and other prefabs of them. So prefab can be nested inside of prefabs. They have a hierarchical uh, structure. So they de define the hi hierarchy in the night city. That's a very important feature for the uh, HLOD generation described later with our approach. And um, yeah, they enforce the correct hierarchy in the world. Um, and they also made it possible to build a city from smaller repeated blocks. So one prefab could be instantiated many times to create something bigger. Uh, and uh, we could update it faster by updating this prefab. We updated all of, um, all of prefabs that use it as, uh, as part of it. Um, if you're familiar with Unreal, you could think of prefab as about uh, as, uh, something similar to level, but with uh, frequently used uh, nesting of those uh, prefabs inside of each other. And if you're using Unity, there is similar mechanism, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, the second mechanism uh, is named appearances. Appearances in Red Engine are files that store different, uh, visually different versions of uh, assets, um, of characters or vehicles. Uh, so here you can see me clicking through the different appearances of uh, Herrera Outlaw vehicle. As you can see, they differ with uh, some shapes, some meshes are used or disappear in different appearances. Um, yeah, and there's a number of them, of course. And it was the first way to create uh, different versions of um, vehicles and characters, and it was used a lot. So, now we know the scale of, uh, of uh, Night City and we know how we accomplished it. Let's, cause, let's talk a bit about issues it uh, cast. Um, answering the question from the screen, we cannot just load every instance of every mesh at LOD0 and display it. This would, uh, no machine would handle that. So we had to use some tricks. Um, let's firstly 
list problems that are caused by the scale, and then we'll talk about um, how we can prevent them. So the, fir uh, the first problem that comes to mind is probably just the scale, the number of polygons and nodes in the scene. Of course, it has multiple problems, but uh, two of mass, uh, two, two of very important ones are the problem with string, because there's a limit of how many data we can transfer to the GPO, uh, and the more polygons and nodes we've got, the more data we've got to transfer, and the mechanism is called uh, occlusion calling. calling. We are deciding what object will be displayed and what will not be displayed based on the fact if it's not occluded by something or if it's behind the camera. And the more nodes we've got in the world, the more time this process took, takes, as we get to check more objects. So that's one thing to prevent. Uh, another issue we can uh, no, encounter is named, is connected to quad overshading. And quad overshading um, is connected to the fact that GPU, for many operations, doesn't use single, poly, uh, single pixels. It uh, um, processes quads, so um, structures for two on two pixels. And uh, if uh, polygon covers only part of this quad, we still need to process all of the quad, and we are wasting some of processing power. Um, here you can see example of when it works and when it doesn't work uh, properly. The polygon on the left is quite big and, uh, and it has a regular shape. It covers 14 pixels. Those are the green pixels, pixels that at least a bit overlap with polygon. Uh, and we need to process 16 pixels as those are four quads to display it. The one on the right is long and thin. It also covers 14 pixels, but we need to process twice the number of pixels because of, um, because of those uh, quads. Um, so those are two, 32 pixels to be processed. Mm, yeah, and the second image presents the usual way we uh, visualize the, mm, the quad overshading. The brighter areas are just, uh, have just more problems with quad overshading, that's all. And the last thing I wanted to talk about, uh, materials. The, mat the more materials we've got in the, in the scene, the more draw calls we need to perform. So that's one thing. Also, materials have different complex complexity, and uh, some materials are more uh, complex than others. So if we're using them on some small mesh in the distance, we are probably wasting some power, computational power, as details provided by this complex shader would not be visible anymore. OK, so now we understand the problems that uh, the scale provides. Let's talk about solutions for those issues. Uh, and the first one, the one you probably know, is named LOD. Uh, LOD, so levels of details, level of detail, it's just a simplified version of a mesh. Uh, it helps in a number of ways. It limits the number of polygons that the mesh has. Uh, it limits the problems with quad, quad overdraw as polygons are bigger and more uh, properly shaped. Uh, and it can also limit issues with materials as we could replace complex materials on LOD with something simpler or we could just limit the number of materials, so limit the number of draw costs required to, to display it. When we are just getting further away from the mesh, it, will, it gets replaced with a LOD version of it, as you can see here on the screen. Uh, but this doesn't affect the number of nodes in the scene. For this, we need something more complex, and the tool for that is named hierarchical LOD, HLOD. For, uh, during development of Cyberpunk, we used a different name proxy, and uh, I'll be using those names interchange interchangeably, but in fact, uh, proxy means the same thing that HLOD means in this context. <clears throat> and it helps in a similar way to the LOD, um, but also limits the number of nodes, as it replaces more complex structures, not simple single geometry, but uh, for example, whole building made from uh, many smaller meshes. Uh, yeah, and here on the screen you can see example of that. There's a some small building made from a lot of small meshes, um, some sheets of metal, and um, the simplified geometry we can see here, it replaces all of it. It unloads, the, we are unloading the complex shapes and we are loading the one single geometry. One note about it, it's really simple compared to the original geometry as HLOD should be loaded from the really big distance. And this should not be noticeable. Yep. Um, oh, one more note. I said previously that uh, prefabs uh, determined the correct hierarchy in the world and that it was very important for us. This is because of HLODs. In um, Red Engine, we've used uh, prefabs to uh, create HLODs. So HLOD replaced a single prefab. For example, single district, as district was a prefab, single subdistrict, as subdistrict was a prefab under the district, and same with 
buildings and single objects. Uh, so the correct hierarchy made, us, made it possible to replace it with uh, HLOD. Um, Unreal has a different approach. You may be familiar with it. Uh, HLODs in Unreal are generated by combining nodes from one certain area. So that's a different approach. It doesn't use hierarchy at all, and we based everything on hierarchy. Here you will see an example of those mechanics in actions on this one building I showed you before. Um, Firstly, you'll see how small geometry gets replaced with LOD of this geometry, and then you'll see how the whole building, when you are very far away from it, gets replaced with a simplified geometry you also saw earlier. Okay, so now you can see um, small nodes being replaced. And um, now, now the whole building was replaced. Hopefully that was not very noticeable, as that's, the, uh, that's what we are aiming for, of course. Okay, so now we've established uh, what we need and why we need it. Uh, let's talk about how we were able to create them, create uh, LODs and HLODs. Um, we could go with uh, hand generation, so skilled artists could create uh, LOD, simplified version of mesh. Now, of course, the good artist with a proper knowledge of uh, optimization would create the best possible LOD. But for our nested approach, uh, nested complicated approach in uh, Night City, that would be quite problematic. I'm created, I created a simple presentation of why this would be problematic. So let's say that a, it's an um, LOD created by an artist, the mesh is on the left, the LOD is on the right. But this mesh is used in prefab. And for this prefab, we also need to create um, geometry of uh, HLOD. We need to create textures of HLOD, so artist creates them. But this one is used in another prefab, for which we also need to create both geometry and textures. And this one is used in another prefab. And we could go on like this for some time, uh, higher and higher in the levels. Uh, and now let's assume that uh, the basic mesh gets changed. For example, it was moved or the color was changed in a significant way, so it's visible even from this distance. Artists, after making such change, would have to replace HLFD of every higher level prefab. Uh, and remember that we worked in parallel. Different prefabs could be checked out and edited by different artists at the same time. Every one of them would have to update the, the prefab, uh, higher level prefabs. And remember by, about keeping changes of other artists. So that gets really complicated really fast. Other reason why we couldn't uh, go with, uh, didn't want to go with uh, such solution was that we've, we're using a lot of different appearances of characters and vehicles and characters and vehicles are also replaced by uh, HLOD. So when we are getting farther away from the car or the person, it gets replaced with a simple geometry. Um, yes, and as you can see, we got a lot uh, of appearances in the game. For every one of them, uh, we would have to create a separate texture, and for most of them, we would have to create a separate geometry. And if, we, if we'd be doing that by hand, that would be a great amount of work, of course. Yes. Um, so, obviously, the solution to this problem is uh, to provide some level of automatization, and we did just that. We wanted artists to be uh, not concerned about um, HLODs, just, um, she just, she just uh, create um, content, and then HLOD should be automatically updated based on this content. That was, the, um, that was what we are aiming for. And because of the scale of this task, we decided to go with a solution based on render farm, uh, we could go with one of uh, existing solutions, the commercial solution, but we decided to uh, extend our internal tool called Peons. Um, we created a server for it, we created an infrastructure for it, and we created an interface uh, for users that you can see on this screen, named Dispatcher. So Dispatcher was the name of the interface that allowed users to interact with our render farm. It was created with uh, Qt and uh, Python. Uh, let's see how it works in, like, in uh, general. It was quite standard render farm, but let's go through it. So firstly, Red Engine initializes the job of uh, generation of, for example, HLOD. It exports geometry and materials to our internal, um, internal format named prefab, uh, refab, and uh, textures to PNG, and parameters of uh, job saved, uh, set by a user to JSON file. That's just uh, information to what algorithms should be used and other properties. Next, uh, it, uh, the Red Engine 
notifies the dispatcher that uh, the new job should be created. Dispatcher reads the JSON file. Um, that's how it knows what files should be uh, used and uh, what parameters should be used. Displays an interface that allows artists to uh, change the parameters. Interface is generated based on the content of JSON. We are just creating files for every file uh, filed in the JSON. And uh, yeah, then then dispatcher is responsible for creating the job. Firstly, it copies the files from a local drive, the files exported by Red Editor, to the network location that's uh, accessible by, from both artist site and render farm site. Next, it notifies the Pion's server that uh, a job should be created. And the uh, server creates the job, then assigns the worker to the job. Worker is just a PC that's running a Pion's client application. And uh, Pion's client application loads the um, uh, script that describes the job. For an Azure OD generation, the script was composed of running Houdini, loading proper scene, setting parameters, and inputs, uh, input paths of meshes, and um, generating the uh, geometry, saved in uh, another internal file, of, uh, file format of ours, RE file format, and uh, again, textures in PNG. When dispatcher uh, realizes that the job is done, it downloads those um, exported files, those generated files, back to the local drive and imports them to the engine. Again, there was a script that described uh, what should be done after the job. Uh, so dispatcher handled uh, version control integration, importing um, all of those files and setting parameters and prefabs on appearances so they will be used. That's how the uh, render farm works, worked. Uh, we used it, like I said, for many tasks, uh, including LOD generation and HLOD generation. So let's talk about how it was used in practice by artists. Let's start with LOD generation. For <clears throat> LOD generation, we created a simple interface for artists in uh, Maya that was composed of some controls that could, uh, uh, so the artists could change parameters and just run a job. The tool would then create a job, download results, and import them to the scene. Um, Let's see how it worked. As you can see, the uh, generated results are imported to the same scene and can be used by artist. For HLOD generation, uh, artist could trigger it to, for example, change parameters of generation or to regenerate some sector he just uh, changed. There was an appropriate action inside of Red Engine uh, under write menu button. And it utilizes the whole process described earlier. Uh, for batch generation, so mass regeneration of every prefab in, in Night City or um, mass regeneration of proxy of every appearance in Night City, we went with a different approach. We used the uh, Python interpreter integrated in uh, Red Engine. We created a script that handled all the process by itself. It just um, handled the export, the copying the files, monitoring the process, downloading results, and everything like this. Uh, this process could be run from, on local machines, but uh, usually it was run on build systems on all the same computers that were responsible for creating the builds of the game. One of those machines was responsible for managing the process, so exporting every file, managing the, uh, creating jobs, downloading results, and other machines could be uh, converted to peon uh, workers. Um, so they did the job. Uh, we're still using this pipeline um, for, for uh, different stages of production. The frequency of how uh, often we are generating uh, proxies was different, of course. But for a uh, lot of time, it was weekly. So every week, we are generating every proxy of um, characters and every proxy of uh, prefab in the Night City. Um, yes, uh, as you can see on the slide, those are numbers representing the, some statistics connected to this. Uh, up to this moment, we created more than 415,000 jobs, and the count is still uh, rising. Uh, we did run the um, generate appearance proxies job on dispatcher on a build system more than 400 times, and uh, the job of the generation of prefab proxies on the build system uh, more than 300 times. So that's just like a general number to, to have information how often this was running. Okay, so for generation of uh, proxy geometry, we tried many different, of, of refabs, we, we tried many different algorithms. Uh, our pipeline was quite easy to uh, extend, so we were checking new, new ways to generate them from time to time. 
and I'm going to go through some of the most interesting ones. Let's start with information on how it works in purpose. Like I said before, we are using Houdini. For those of you that don't know, Houdini is a DCC software with node-based procedural workflow, and uh, it's quite nice for those uh, set tasks. We had a separate graph of Houdini for any type of job, so appearance proxy generation for characters had a different graph than appearance proxy generation for, uh, for vehicle and for prefab. Mm, and uh, we updated it regularly with some fixes and mm, changes. Here you can see an example, a graph that was responsible for generation of prefab, um, prefab HLOD. And the section on close-up is a section responsible for generation algorithm selection. As you can see, it's a simple switch with some inputs. We are just changing the uh, input of the switch to uh, select the algorithm. So extending this uh, was quite easy. We are just creating a new node, connecting it to the switch, and that was a new algorithm that could be used. <clears throat> And let's start with the first of those algorithms. Uh, we named it surface reconstruction. We're starting with a high poly geometry. That's just a geometry of a whole prefab that will be uh, that we need HLOD for. We're creating a shape that could contain it. Contain it. Uh, in this example, it's uh, half of the sphere. In fact, a bit more than half of a sphere. We are scattering a big number of points on this uh, surface, and now. We are projecting those points onto the geometry. You could think that uh, we are moving them to the center of the sphere and stopping when they encounter uh, geometry. And I'll get a visualization of that. If that's, uh, that's probably better to see than uh, here. Yes. So, in fact, we generated a point cloud that represents the geometry. We're using the Poisson surface reconstruction algorithm for uh, conversion of this uh, point cloud to the final surface of the geometry. This gave us uh, like an outer surface of, of uh, node without information what's inside. We ignored every uh, geometry that's inside, that it's not visible from uh, the outside. So that's exactly what we need for uh, proxies. And this algorithm worked quite well for um, some complex shapes like the one you can see here. Another one was named Rayscan. We are again starting with a uh, high geometry of high poly geometry of the prefab. Then we are generating a bounding box that can contain it, which will be saved for later for use. And we are creating a plane or grid at one of ends of this um, bounding box. Uh, that matches the size of this wall of the bounding box. Next, we are extruding every face of this uh, grid up to the moment when it encounters geometry or up to the infinity. Uh, so we get like a negative. We, we, the geometry covers the uh, space that geometry doesn't cover looking from this side. That's how we could understand it. And we're just simply doing a boolean operation on the bounding box of this object and on this newly created shape. So that's uh, the result of this iteration. We're doing the same for many other directions, same algorithm, with a difference. We're not using bounding box for boolean, but the result of the previous step. And that's the final geometry we're uh, getting from that. This algorithm worked quite well for less organic shapes. As you could see, the proxy that it generated for uh, this mega building is quite, quite nice, I'd say. Uh, another one was uh, primarily used for um, HLOD generation of characters and vehicles. It's uh, based on voxels, and uh, again, it's starting with import of hyperly geometry, this time a character. We are generating a sign distance field uh, around this uh, character. Science distance field in every point in, the, in this field represents the uh, distance from this point to the surface of geometry. As you can see, the green values are zero and small values. The more yellow the value is, the bigger it is. That's uh, what you generated, and we will be using that instead of geometry from this moment onwards. Um, yes, so now we are generating uh, geometry based only on this um, sign distance field. Uh, we're just generating surface everywhere where the assigned distance field is equal to zero. So again, it gives us a mesh that represents the outer surface of the, of the geometry, which is what we need. Um, and it's a continuous one, so it's quite easy to optimize it uh, later with simple algorithms. Um, but it's quite dense. So the last step is to simplify it, uh, optimize it. And that's I found name, uh, our final geometry for this character. And uh, for some algorithms, we needed help from artists. Um, we gave them possibility to 
um, create some uh, helper meshes, some helper shapes that were used later to guide the process of generation of proxies. First of those algorithms <coughs> was named boxy proxy. Artist could provide a simple uh, representation of, uh, of the prefab made from a really simple shapes like uh, uh, boxes, cylinders, spheres, of, or some geometry he created, but it didn't have to be uh, optimized. It didn't have to be a fully proper proxy. Shapes could overlap uh, and stuff like this. So it was a bit easier to create than the final proxy. And it gave artists possibility to, uh, to decide on what shapes are important, what shapes could be ignored. Um, yes, that's why it was used. The second one of those is a full custom proxy mesh. Uh, so, for a most problematic and important edge of this, we went with just uh, handily uh, created uh, meshes by artists. Like I said earlier, this approach uh, could provide some problems uh, with a nested approach to the, uh, to the structure of the city. Uh, but firstly, uh, those meshes were created usually late in the production and at the moment where we didn't really expect many uh, major changes to the shape of the prefabs to the city. And secondly, uh, we still generated all of textures by our pipelines. So small changes like a change of material would still be generated after, the, after it happened um, during next mass, mass regeneration. So there were two more, uh, there were many more algorithms, but I'm gonna mention about uh, two of them. Uh, first one is convex hull, just briefly. It's a standard algorithm that you may be familiar with as it's used for generation of, uh, of uh, collision meshes often. It's just a simple convex uh, set that contains the shape. And the second one was what named uh, bounding, uh, bounce combine. It was based on bounding boxes of small geometry that we used to uh, guide the generation of uh, HLODs. I'm just mentioning them. They were not that popular, but still, they were popular. And here we can see a graph that represents uh, the change in how proxies were generated uh, during the year 2020. <clears throat> As you can see, it starts at the beginning of 2020 because uh, that's when we provided an option to select an algorithm for proxy generation. And it ends somewhere around production. I'm not sure where. Um, the horizontal axis uh, informs us on how many proxies were generated. Uh, colors inform us on what algorithm was used for, for generation of those proxies. And the vertical axis is, of course, the timeline. As we can see, we started with uh, 2,000 proxies, about 2,000 proxies in Hope Night City, generated with a ray scan algorithm uh, described earlier. Previously, we generated them with a voxel algorithm, but it was changed later. Um, artists started to uh, replace those proxies with, uh, with meshes created with the help of uh, helper meshes. So with uh, custom meshes, fully created by artists, those are green ones and with boxy proxy, the one on uh, the orange one, the orange part of the graph. You can also see that the number of proxies in Night City was rising throughout uh, the, that year, and it went from about 2,000 to about, I'd say, 7,000 proxies in all of the city. And you can see that uh, it also affected other algorithms, like the number of ray scan proxies is also rising. Okay, and, oh, sorry. Yes, one more graph. Uh, that's the state of uh, proxy generation algorithms the, at the time of path 1.5. As we can see, uh, almost three, two thirds of uh, proxies are now generated by hand by artists with a usage of uh, custom mesh algorithm. But other algorithms, algorithms are still used. The number of proxies is approaching, no, it's uh, exceeded 9,000 um, HLODs for um, prefabs in that city. For appearance proxy generation, we had to perform some additional steps. Uh, so for uh, characters, we had to simplify the hair and uh, assign a special hair shader to it that would match the visual, um, the way that the hair looked from the distance. The normal material didn't work. Mm. And we had to simplify shader, uh, simplify skinning. As you can see, uh, characters are of course animated and HLODs of characters were also animated. Uh, you can see on the idle, idle, idle in animation here that the uh, HLOD also moves, just like the original MF moved. For vehicles, we had to uh, remove lights and replace them with a special shader that 
that was controlled by the game. So we are getting uh, far away from the car. It wouldn't suddenly turn off or on the lights. The state of lights was maintained. And I couldn't create a graph for uh, algorithms of uh, HLOD of um, appearances of characters and vehicles uh, generation, as there was just one of them. We uh, didn't have to provide additional algorithms for generation of HLODs of characters and vehicles. And every uh, HLOD in, uh, in the game was of character of vehicle was created with this pipeline. There are no custom meshes. So it was um, quite success for the game. Uh, here you can see examples of um, original geometry of appearance, switching with a proxy for it. It usually matches it quite well. I'd like to say a bit more about why it was possible for uh, characters and vehicles and why was it um, so much harder for, um, for buildings, for buildings and objects, for prefabs. Well, uh, characters and vehicles are a bit more regular. The size of them is quite uh, similar. Even if we compare some small child to, for example, Adam Smasher, it's, uh, the difference is still not uh, even close to the difference between vending machine or small advertisement uh, compared to a mega building that uh, stands next to it. And for both of them, we had to generate HLDs. So that's one thing. Characters and vehicles are more similar, and we could fine tune the algorithm so that it worked for them. The other thing is that for both uh, characters and vehicles, we could uh, find some common elements that are common for all of them and fine tune them again. For example, for characters, we could uh, think about uh, hair, that we had a special part of the graph that was responsible for parsing the hair, and we could like fine tune it, it worked well. And for cars, we could think about um, wheels, every car has wheels, or almost every car, and we could fine tune the part of graph that was responsible for extracting and optimizing wheels, of course. Uh, yes. Uh, I said that for prefabs, there were not many um, common elements that could be optimized in a special way. But uh, there was one that I'd like to mention. We could, um, well, there were windows. Here you can see an HLOD0, uh, LOD0, so the main geometry shader for uh, windows. It, it's not really a, a real room, of course. It's a shader that utilizes the mechanism called uh, interior mapping. Um, you, if you know Parallax, it works in quite similar way. It just uh, pretends that there's some room inside. We had different textures that were um, pretending that they are different rooms, but still the number of them was um, like uh, not that big, and uh, we wanted to, we said to feel that the number of rooms available is bigger. So we created some obstruction. A user cannot really see what's inside. He cannot see the details of the room because of those uh, blurred and dirty windows. Uh, yeah, and that was important because user could come really close to those windows and uh, peek uh, into the inter insides of them. Another thing about windows is that they had a lot of parameters, uh, like the color of, uh, of light inside, the amount of light inside, or uh, the amount of curtains that are closed or open, such, are, um, such uh, parameters. They were randomized, so for example, for one building you set it to some level and then Randomization decided that some windows are more or less uh, opened. And the randomization was based on position, which is important for uh, LODs of those windows. So, <clears throat> for LODs of these windows, or HLODs of buildings with uh, windows, we went with a different approach. Firstly, of course, the shader is uh, way um, simpler. As you can see, we decided to drop the abstraction users should not really be able to go close enough to them to see internals of this uh, room. So the obstruction is not needed. From a distance, he should not see details anyway. Uh, also, I told you earlier about parameters that were, uh, that were randomized uh, with a use of position. That's important here, because the position of windows is still the same. The geometry of windows was uh, copied to a higher level proxy. And uh, the randomization works the same for this level as it worked for previous uh, level. So the amount of light, of amount of, uh, of uh, curtains being opened or closed should be, should be the same as for L of D uh, zero. But still, uh, for every group of windows, we had to create a special shader with uh, parameters copied from the uh, lower level uh, prefab. And, and also, every window is still a separate geometry. So we are multiplying the number of locals, but we are multiplying the number of materials. And we are multiplying the number of uh, uh, geometry in the scene, as every uh, window has to be a separate geometry. 
So for a higher level, we went with a bit different approach. <coughs> okay, so for highest level of proxies of uh, HROD's, performance is the key. And uh, we uh, dropped the idea of creating windows as a separate geometry. Uh, windows were just represented by a special shader that generated uh, rectangular shapes on the surface of it. Uh, this made it possible to do limit the number of polygons as windows were not separate polygons. They were just uh, the same geometry of, uh, as HROD and the number of draw calls. Uh, all of proxies visible at the same time, at this, at this level, all proxies uh, that use the long distance window version of the shader have the same shader with the same parameters uh, and they are all rendered in a single draw call. So that's a significant um, simplification. Uh, Yes, and uh, I said about that um, randomization based on um, position, so still it works well for this level, uh, although it's greatly simplified. Uh, I created a simple video. I blocked switching from HLOD to the original geometry on some part of city, so we could see how it uh, works from distance and how it works from you know, up close. Firstly, you can see that this uh, level of HLOD, it's, uh, it's visible now when the city is just like silhouette on the distance. You can see details of buildings, really. Uh, we are that far away from them. And that's on purpose. This level of, um, uh, this type of uh, uh, HLOD was used on a level of uh, districts or sub-districts on very big parts of the city. That would switch to an HLOD in a very, very far distance. Okay, so let's play it. We're coming closer to it and you can see that uh, if we'd be really close to this proxy, it would be a really simple geometry with really simple shader. Those windows don't look that good from up close, but from a distance, we just see that some part of building, and the, of course the windows were generated only on the places where the original geometry had, building, uh, had uh, windows. Some parts of buildings have windows, and those windows are um, light, they have lights with a proper color and things like that. So from distance, it worked quite well. Uh, okay. Oh, it's out of play. Okay, so in fact that was all. Thank you for listening. <laughs>of uh, buildings was uh, significant and we wanted to optimize the thing um, as good as we wanted. So the closer we were to the production, the more simpler proxies we needed and the better looking proxies we needed. So artists started to replace them one by one, by one with uh, the ones that they created. Also, as at the beginning we needed uh, proxies to like um, have some numbers on performance, improving performance, at the end we wanted to squeeze every possible uh, polygon from the scene. So the HLOD is created by artists were well, good for that. We didn't have, um, need to regenerate them often at this stage, but we need like to squeeze every performance and so when artists could do this, he could do this. Um, yeah, that's the thing. Okay, I have got a question because I worked for Dying Light 2 on a very similar thing and I would say that we, we mostly used uh, things closer to boxy proxies, how you call it. Uh, but the thing that I'm interested in, uh, what was the approach for uh, textures on the H loads? Did you 
automatize, automate the process of uh, generating textures? Uh, did you build atlases? How was the approach for optimizing uh, textures? Yes, so uh, every texture was generated with the process uh, itself. Uh, we used Houdini for that and it was part of the same graph, just a different, different part of it. Um, we had to recreate all of materials from the engine in Houdini with use, it, uh, uh, with use of VEX. That was a big task and, and a lot of work uh, went to the support of this way. But uh, how, that's how it worked. Uh, all of them were just baked, through the, uh, baked from the original geometry with those shaders applied to a generated geometry based on a location, on a distance. Okay, so thank you. And one more question. Uh, uh, as I understand, you didn't generate the whole city all the time. Uh, you generated things uh, in parts. Uh, but looking into how Unreal and Epic approached their uh, Matrix Awakens demo, they mentioned that they think like they regenerated the whole city for a few hundred times. Uh, so assuming that changes appear in content all the time, uh, did, how was the way to check if things updated so that you have uh, loads for the city up to date? Well, honestly, we didn't really check if the uh, thing was updated. We were just regenerating uh, HLDs for every prefab. So the batch job that went uh, from a big time of production every weekend was just opening every prefab, regenerating an HLD for it, and um, creating another one. That was the job. Okay, so if you wanted to regenerate the whole city in one run, how long would it take? Uh, about uh, 15 hours, something like this at the end. Like I said, the buffs drops, maybe a bit more, maybe more closer to 20, but it would fit in a weekend. That's why we did it on a weekend. Um, and like I said, every weekend we generate, regenerated both appearances, every appearance, and every prefab proxy um, for some time of production. Later, we were just um, doing it uh, less frequently, of course. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, too. So, anyone else? Or Okay. Thank you, Dan.